Hello and welcome back to another episode of Soccer Supernova with me, Amy Canavan. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the former Dundee United, Celtic, Bristol City and Dumbarton defender, Mark Wilson. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Um, how you, How's it going? Yeah, thanks for having me, Amy. Um, it's going fine, same as everybody else, just trying to work my, my way through lockdown. And can I wait to get back to actually watching football in the terraces and and playing six sides and you know missing actually the interaction with with ex teammates and stuff like that that we we have a good laugh with but everything else apart from that, that's fine fantastic well a little something you've been you've picked up during lockdown how's a how's the celtic huddle podcast going how's that going it's going brilliant actually um you know it was something that came about um quite unexpectedly if i'm honest and we started it back i think it was I think it was the tail end of September, maybe October we started it. Uh, and obviously we started it thinking that this would be a season to remember. We'd have plenty of good things to talk about and the, yep. the run up to a potential 10 in a row. And it's taken a slightly different turn, if I'm honest. And, you know, we go on there, we're, we're honest, we give our honest opinions. We don't really, we don't really pander to, to anybody. Uh, you know, we don't go in there with green tinted glasses and and kid on things aren't as serious uh, as they really are. And we've had some great guests on there, some ex players, some big players on there who have spoke their mind, and players that are close to to Neil, players that have played under Peter, who know how the club run. And you know, the feedback's been great, and it's good to actually chat about some positive things over the last couple of weeks rather than. The months of November and December, where we were kind of uh, dragged down by a lot of the the nastier stuff that was going on, but hopefully it's on the up now. Well, I was just going to say that to you. What is what are your feelings right now? Obviously, you were you were coached by Neil, and we'll come to that a little bit later. But I think you've you've sort of touched on it there. We all sort of we didn't really quite expect a a, a feelings quite as quite as large as it has been here. Um, what what are your views towards it? What's went What's went wrong? Can you can you imagine how wrong it's went? Well, I couldn't imagine how wrong it was going to go this season. I don't think anybody could. And uh, I thought when I thought when we came at the transfer window uh, in the summer, keeping keeping a lot of the players, um, especially Edward in particular, um, I thought it was a positive thing. And you look at the start of the season, and I was looking at it last night. Some of the the stats and and Edward stats in particular. You open up in the first game against Hamilton and he scores a hat trick and uh, you're thinking, well, they've started fantastically well. Um, they've made some good signings uh, or, or on the face of it, good signings that looked that way. And everything was looking rosy. Um, now, there's been certain issues that have, they've taken their toll on, on Celtic. You know, there's been a lot of COVID-related issues as well where, where the likes of Ryan Christie and things go away in international duty and they come back and have to isolate and that hurts them for the, the first old firm game of the season. And I think that was that was a pivotal point in the season. I'm not making excuses for Celtic because they still had a, a good enough squad to compete in that game. But losing that game and, and not laying a finger on Rangers in that game, I think seriously damaged Celtic and seriously damaged the mood and morale about the place at that time. Um, Edward, of course, contracted COVID and people thought he was going to play. Turned out he didn't that day. And it just went from bad to worse from then. Signings who have come in certainly haven't lived up to their billing of previous clubs. Um, and I think we all know who, who they are. A lot of money spent on them. And that, you know, mixed with probably the, the guys who have carried Celtic over the last eight, nine years probably not performing to their peak level have contributed to a pretty poor you would say a four month period i think probably when you look at october november december maybe the start of january um that's enough to to ruin a season and coinciding with rangers playing so well and and really not dropping any goal uh, any points um puts us where we are which is too far behind and if you're this far behind in February then it's it's all but over. It is all but over and um like I say I'm not expecting you to say anything out of turn. Obviously you were you were quite close with Neil played with him managed that uh, managed under I'm sorry. Do you see him being in charge next year? Well I was speaking about funny enough I was speaking about it today. Now if you asked me a number of weeks ago I would have said definitely not. I, I just wonder if 
if the club have got to a stage now that there might be a small possibility that there could be a chance and he'll still be in charge. Um, you know, changing the chief executive at the club is a massive step. Um, to change the chief exec and the manager at the same time could be a change ahead of recruitment because that position has been well known to have, have had its failings this season. You throw all that into the mix, it's a big rebuild uh, at the end of June. And to get that perfect in time for Champions League qualifiers and the start of a big season all at the one time is, is going to be pretty difficult. And I just wonder if Neil... If Neil continues to win, there's 10 games to go. <laughs> and if he, if he wins them, imagine if he beats Rangers twice, gets to the end of the season. Well, there'll be a situation where where the board say, um, we'll keep Neil for the start of the season. I don't know. Uh, as I said, at the, at the new year, when they lost at Ibrox, uh, it certainly didn't look likely that he would be manager. And, you know, I, I say that with the greatest respect about Neil because I love playing under him. I loved him as a teammate. I played probably my best season or a couple of my best seasons under Neil. I enjoyed that immensely. But for some reason, it's just not happened this year. And, you know, people have a shelf life at clubs and I, I just wondered if it was time up. The big thing will be the season tickets, you know, season ticket renewal thing. The club have to keep that in mind and and attract fans to put their hands in their pockets to, to fork out. And if Neil Lennon is that man, I, I'm not too sure. We've we've touched on it there. You are now part of that fan media sort of sort of world with the podcast. And do do you worry for the club in the sense that if Neil is kept on next year, you you sort of you, we're seeing it ourselves um, on on Celtic Huddle on Axom. There there is a there's large Collins obviously for him to be out, and we're not wanting any. Um, is we're not anti Lennon. Nobody's nobody's that. But do you fear for the status of the not the status of the club, but the the welfare of the club and the love towards the club if Neil is kept on? I don't think the love will ever die for Celtic. That's that's the one constant. I think you know before even me and you were here on this on this planet that the love will always be there and and long after us and long after Neil Lennon. I just think it's such a crucial period. Now the the half the half term half-season figures were released and a £6 million loss doesn't go unnoticed even for a club like Celtic. If, if that's sustained over the, the coming period, then you know you quickly run into trouble. Now, Celtic are, are very fortunate to have a, a huge fan base and, and the fans put their hands in their pockets more often than not. Um, and this coming months are in, as important as any that's that's been for a long time. Uh, in terms of fans putting their hands in their pockets in such a a difficult time uh, where people are out of work, but they still find a way to fork out four hundred and five hundred pounds for a season ticket, and that's what I think the Celtic board will be will be thinking about. Um, I think the Celtic fans will be thinking of that. I think there'll be some who whose vision and, and love for the club is unwavered to will no matter who's in charge buy their season tickets but I also think there's a large portion who will be sitting waiting on an announcement whether the manager is going to be Neil Lennon or Dermot Desmond is going to come in with a big name who will make fans want to go and uh, and pay you know huge amounts of money to renew who'd be your big name big name oh what question well look yeah, with the, the Celtic huddle we, we've chatted about these names going about and yeah. Uh, Eddie Howe's been mentioned numerous a time, numerous times. Lucky enough to have Mark Burchill on. Uh, Mark Burchill's worked closely with him at Bournemouth and spoke very highly of him uh, as a coach. And he seems somebody who would re be really hands on, um, play a nice, you know, brand of football. Um, and he, he seems appealing. On the other hand, we we get the comments in, like I'm sure you do yourself, of people saying, "No, no way, we wouldn't touch him." Um, it, it's hard to think. A big name, Rafa Benitez. Would Rafa Benitez come here and and do the same job? Would he have the same hunger as he's had uh, at, at Premiership clubs? I, I don't know. Um, I, I really think that's a problem the, the Celtic board may have as well. I think if there was one outstanding name, um, like a Brendan Rodgers, when he was out of work, come the Ronnie Dyla era because I remember when Ronnie Dyla it was it was broadcast and Dermot Desmond came out and says 
we're going to dial a step down in the coming weeks and months, and we're going to you know get someone in place. Brendan Rogers' name was touted about. I remember Clyde Super Scoreboard almost every night. People chatting about Brendan Rogers. I thought it was out of Celtic's reach to get him because his stock was that high and he was that well thought of and his his wages would command uh, it would be too much, I thought, for Celtic. But Dermot Desmond made it happen. I, I'm scratching my head to think a Hollywood signing uh, or or manager that's out there just now. Um people Mark were saying Hughes. more close. Mark Hughes. Well, Mark Hughes would I suppose appeal to some. He's he's somebody who's got vast experience uh in the game and especially down south. He's somebody that commands huge respect. Um Again, would they appease the Celtic fans? I don't know. I, I think there's this level of, I think that some Celtic fans want, that there are always some who want a connection to Celtic in some way. Either had played with them, had come through Ireland, or I don't know, have got a granny that supports Celtic. <laughs> or this, and there's and there's a large portion who, who want a, a young, you know, forward-thinking manager who's maybe done well in the continent, who who dresses smartly on the touchline, you know, who who presents well in press conferences. That's that's the kind of modern manager. Um, you know, in Scotland, Jack Ross is pretty much that character in Scotland. But Celtic fans, maybe it's not it's not a popular one because he's in Scotland just now. I don't. The answer, listen. The long answer is, uh, I don't really know who's out there. But it was interesting when we were doing a other podcast the other week in Village Boas when uh, yeah. and, and went over and it broke that he was resigning. And instantly, people are on right away saying he's a man for us. Yeah, let's get him in. Let's do a swap deal. And possibly somebody like him would fit the bill. That's aiming big, isn't it? I am. Um... Great views there. Really interesting views. Who would you who would you like to have played under? Well, you've well touching it. You've played under some great managers. Um, any is there anyone right now you go? Oh, I'd have liked to have played under them. Out of those who have mentioned. Well, look, I, I must admit, I was I was a wee bit jealous of the players playing under Brendan Rodgers. Um, I, I was I was I was sorry that I missed him because you know speaking to some of the players that I was I was at the club with. Um, you know, James Forrest, Scott Brown, guys like that. Um, just asking what what he's like and and what he brought to the 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 club. Um, even like John Kennedy and Steve McManus who are involved and in, in was first hand and seen some of the stuff. It just blew their mind how detailed it was. Um, his training. Um, I think how he made players who were playing pretty ordinary football the year before elevate the performance levels and he got the best out of them and I would have just loved to have played his style of football and it's funny because years before when I was at Bristol City um, with Jody Morris um, I always remember me and Jody Morris having a chat about Brendan Rogers. I can't remember where it was at the time maybe it was at Swansea or something Brendan Rogers was and Jody I think had came across him uh, part Chelsea. Of Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea. That, that would have been Chelsea. And he said, You would have loved to have played in, or, or played under Brendan Rogers. The, the type of football the man he was, um, I would have loved to have experienced that. And just his, his thoughts in the game, I think it just kind of revolutionised Celtic. It just changed the full club in such a short space of time. And look, it's, there's no question uh, the success he brought. I know some Celtic fans will never forgive him for leaving. But uh, you have to look at how good a, an actual coach he was for Celtic, the success he brought, and look what he's done now with Leicester, a team who are well, obviously on a lot of money compared to this league, but in comparison to your cities and Liverpools, he's he's shown what he's doing all right, yeah. Oh, he's, I think he's doing more more than all right, and I think you'll, you'll I think there'll always be a part. Of him, well, I can't speak for him, but you think there'd always be a part of him that he regrets. The situation manor, anyway, in the manner. Um, but I think he'll sit and think I, I made the right decision. I served my time, I done well for the club and I left them in a in a good place. However, your first manager, Alex Smith, he was he was quite underrated and he but he gave you your debut touching against Dundee, he threw you right in at the deep end, didn't he? How big was he just to start off your career? It was huge for me. I mean, not only me, a number of players and not even at Dundee United. Um you know what, see at Dundee United, I probably wasn't aware. Uh Alex Smith and his achievements and, and the standing in the game he actually had. You know, as a young kid coming through, 16, uh, just turning 17, Alex was at the club, but he treated the young players brilliantly. 
absolutely brilliantly. Um, uh, and you're right, he, he, he chucked me in against Dundee and he always, you know, he, he spoke uh, very well to me all the time, my family, the young players around the club. And it's only when now I sit back and I look at some of Alex's achievements and what he what he did beforehand with his, his previous clubs, it was remarkable. Uh, and the influence he has, uh, you know, at the SFA as well, and young coaches, even when I did my, my coaching badges, my licence, he was down there as one of the assessors um, and the advice he passes on there. But I was, ugh, listen, it was unbelievable. At the time, make my debut, uh, uh, the, the day before him, sweet in the corridors in the days that footballers actually had to do jobs and didn't get home at one one in the afternoon we actually had to stay and clean boots and you, you've heard it all before in corridors and I was sweeping and mopping the corridor when Morris Malpass told me to get myself home to the digs and rest up but saying that that was still at half four in the afternoon so I managed to get home rest up never thought I would play the next day of course because it was a derby and uh, he names the team an hour and a half before the game and I'm in it and I was actually a, a former Celtic player that dropped out that day, David Hanna. So David Hanna, yeah. David Hanna had come back to Dundee United after his, his his triumphs at Celtic with stopping 10 in a row. And I replaced him that day at the, the base of a diamond in midfield, believe it or not. And it, it was great. It was what an experience. Played against a Dundee team that you can never dream of now. With all, all the all Argent- Argentinians, eh? It was mental. I mean, because when Dundee United... My opinion is the biggest club in, in Dundee anyway, just because of their history and their stadium and all that. But at that time, we had kind of a, a core group of Scottish guys and across the road had these guys who had played in World Cups with Argentina. And I mean, Italian Ravinelli was kicking about at that time and, you know, Caballero and guys like that, Georgie Nemzazi. It was unbelievable. So anyway, he pitches in and I, I did OK. Uh, unfortunately, the, the story of my career, I got injured that game and, I missed the I missed the remaining part of the season, but I was uh, a memory I'll cherish, and it's thanks to Alex Smith. You mentioned um, David Hanna there. It was a real experienced side, day. Eh? There was Charlie Miller, Jim McIntyre, and there was Derek McInnes as well, who you went obviously down to Bristol City and worked under. You speak about it to a lot of ex pros. How vital are those experienced players when you're first trying to break in at like say 16, 17? Yeah, ah, uh, listen, they were they were massive. It was one of the best dressing rooms uh, ever ever was in um, because Alex, um, you know, Alex managed to get a squad of players in and it kind of followed on for, for him, you know, other managers added to it. Ian McCall came in as well. And, but Derek McInnes, Charlie Miller, Jim McIntyre, um, you look at Alan Archibald, yeah. Billy Dodge was there, you know, on the one dressing room at the one time. Um, it was incredible to have that experience. And you look at most of them now, most of them have either went into management and been successful as managers in, in their own way. Um, but they were fantastic players. Uh, and, and I loved it. They were great for a young young player like me. You know, put the arm around me, um, talk me through the game. Derek McInnes came in a few years later um, and he was an outstanding captain. Outstanding captain. You know, took the young boys on board treated them well. And it was just great being about that dressing room with Derek and Charlie. Um, they used to sit next to each other and it used to be just stories after stories about the Rangers days because they were in the dressing room with, with Gaza, weren't they? And Gerrant and McCoy and all that. And I, I was just, you'd sit with your, your mouth open just listening to them. And that was hilarious, banter and a great upbringing for me. And, you know, I'm still in touch with, with a lot in them this day. Uh, it was a fantastic grounding for a young player coming through. Touched on it there, um, obviously, that you in your debut you're at the base of that diamond in the midfield and you touched upon him there, Ian McCall, so he solidified you as a right back. Is it is he as a madman as you, as he appears? <laughs> it was at that time. No, listen, I, I see him from time to time now and he's, you know, a lovely guy. He always was a lovely guy. But when he came to United, um, He'd done, he'd done very well at Falkirk and he came to United and he was a fiery character. Um, he's, one of his first jobs was, or first thing he, he did was take me out the team, me and uh, another player, Stephen O'Donnell, who were the two young ones that came through at United and he came and thought we weren't good enough. So so we had to uh, sit on the bench for a few games. Luckily enough, I get in uh, through an injury to some player and he shifted me to right back. And he kind of, uh, what I liked about him was he, he sh- 
you know, he was just honest with you. He, he, you know, if you didn't play well, he told you. You didn't play well. There was none of no pleasantries or anything about that. And that was that's quite I don't know if you get that nowadays in the game. I think people try to skirt about the point and you have to put your arm around players, but back in those days, when I, I say those days like I'm old, but you know, it was that tough love. Aye, 2004 or something, 2003, 2004, it was Ian McCall was was right there and, and, and would tell you to your face. But he, he played me right back and he kind of shifted the team around a bit, made, gave, made me a kind of right back stroke wing back, if you like, and I flourished in that position. Didn't really know the position that well, to be honest, but wasn't that hard. You just run up and down, don't you, and, and cross the balls in the box, and he got the best out of me. I was uh, I was sad to see him go, I must admit. Um, even though he had his moments, had his rants, throwing treatment tables and sandwiches and and uh, tea over the dressing room, uh, I still did uh, miss him when he went. Then that's no word to lie. Um, yeah. You've not, it's, it's not a secret, you obviously you grew up a boyhood Celtic fan. What was it like 2004, Henrik Larsson's last game, and you go and celebrate? Uh, I know, I know. I think I over egged that celebration. <laughs> because I was in the, if I'm right, I was something like the 88th minute and Celtic were 2 0 up, but Look, it was always, it was always a dream of mine to to just play at Celtic Mark yeah. Park. Never mind play for Celtic. So when I got the opportunity with Dundee United, um, you know, numerous occasions before then, that was incredible. Um, and then that day, like, that day was just perfect. See, when you think about it, Henrik Larsson's last game, it was a scorching hot day at Celtic Park. Um, packed. That was packed. It was a brilliant game of football. Um, you know. I played. I, I thought I played well. I was playing against guys that I I, I watched, you know, and, and you know I'd seen them, you know, go to Seville and things. So I don't know. I, he, I, I was going to say I don't know if heroes are the right thing when you're playing against them, but I suppose I you're 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 privileged to play in that last game. Um, so when I got we got the penalty, I was the designated penalty taker. I always remember Charlie Miller coming up to me and saying, "Do you want me to take it?" And I said, "No, nah, no chance." I said I want this, and the the God's honest truth is I, I didn't I didn't strike it particularly well. I knew big Marsh and go as well. Marsh went the wrong way, so I was I was pleased, and uh, it, it was funny enough. I mean, wasn't he recognised or anything in, in those days? So after the game, just my dad, my dad and his pal met me at the front door and just walked out with my boots and walked up to where the forge is, and uh, I think we got a taxi for their home. So you know, no big. No big celebrations. Different or, times, eh? That, well, different. Uh, obviously, I, I wasn't recognised by anybody. Exactly. Apart from the guys who who knew me for Bayless and all that, I was passing by. But it was it was a great memory, and I was fortunate to be involved in that. How long were you aware that Celtic were interested? How long? Until... Uh, I, I'd heard rumours that the, I I'd heard rumours probably that season, going into two thousand and five. I'd heard rumours that they were interested in looking at me, but. Like if I'm honest, I think any young boy doing well, uh, if you ask any young player or if you get an older player on here, they'll tell you you're always told by somebody or a newspaper if you're doing half decent that clubs are looking at you. And at that time with Dundee United, I was constantly told oh, Everton are looking at you or Blackburn's looking at you, um, yeah, Wolves, uh, you know, so all these clubs. And I th I, maybe some of them came close, but as soon as I heard Celtic were interested, that's when your ears start pricking up because Martin O'Neill was still the manager at that time. Um, some of the players they had were just extraordinary at that time. I mean, they just brought in Craig Bellamy, um, I'm sure, in the January as well. And that led up to the, the Cup final, where that was my first Scottish Cup final, played yeah. against so Martin Thompson, scores a goal. And at the end of that season, disappointing for Celtic fans because they'd just lost the league in the last day. And I think Martin had said he was leaving. So... If I'm honest, I thought that was that was a dead and buried. I thought the interest for Celtic was gone. Martin O'Neill had obviously seen me and I played against his sides for a couple of years. I thought once he goes, I wasn't aware of the structure of a football club that because the manager goes, it doesn't mean that the head of recruitment um, or whoever it was at that time or the chief scout, uh, I think it was Tam O'Neill at that time, was still keeping tabs on you. But then Gordon Strachan comes in and... Instantly, I think he signs Paul Telfer. So I thought that was it, dead. And uh, I, I just had I, to go and play 
um, for six months for United and do the best I could. And I was lucky enough, it came back round. Was there added pressure in the cup final? Did you feel something that, like, right, I've really got to impress? Is there that sort of, or are you just totally focused on United at that time? Um, I, listen, I'm not going to lie. Every time I played against Celtic, I, I wanted to impress purely because I wanted to be there. Um, you know, I looked, I looked at, I almost looked at who was who was playing that position. Um, now at that time, Celtic had good fullbacks. Well, they played wing backs. Did it a was there? So. I don't think I was going to shift him with my pace. I pace. think that was time nailed on for a gap. But, you know, you're always thinking a backup player, but then Jackie McNamara was there. And listen, Jackie was one of my heroes growing up. I remember watching him for, you know, 10 year old. So I wondered what the situation with him was. And you just try and impress as much as, as you can. And going into the cup final, of course, I wanted to impress because it's a showpiece game uh, of the season. And Genuinely thought we had a chance that game because the disappointment that was lingering around Celtic at that time was was huge with Martin O'Neill leaving the most in the league. Uh, and it was probably one of the worst cup finals in history. A rainy day, torn down, Alan Thompson scores the worst free kick in history. Um, I think Celtic apparently was it Chris Sutton who slipped, maybe? I think it's Chris Sutton slipped. He slipped and I'm sure it hit the bar, something like that. Anyway, it was terrible. Um but I was, it was, it was great to be involved in the cup final, and you know I was lucky enough I didn't have to wait too long after that to actually be at the club. So you talk about obviously Strachan comes in then in the summer, and there obviously there is a little bit of a rebuild. He got rid of some of the Seville boys, Sutton's away, um, but there's still some big names there: Petrov and Lennon, and then obviously he brings in Roy Keane, Nakamura as well. It was a big dressing room to walk into. I was, I. Um, <laughs> I was really intimidating, uh, being totally honest. Um, uh, listen, I'll never forget my first day. Roy Keane had signed the week before. So, uh, you imagine a couple of weeks previous, I'm watching Roy Keane uh, rip into his Man United teammates on Man United TV and then the big the big hoo-ha about him leaving and the arguments and I'm thinking this is box office because Roy Keane was my hero. I'm thinking this is magic. Then he's at Celtic. I'm thinking what a signing for Celtic that is. He'll be brilliant. And then the next week I'm I'm walking into meeting them going, ah, oh, no, I wish Roy Keane wasn't here now because it was that intimidating experience. And and Roy was one of the first guys I was introduced to. Um, done my medical and everything, you know, the day before and that was a whole rigmarole. Uh, that was pretty near writing day but then the next day reporting for training and nice and early and the sports scientist Jim Henry's walking me around the dressing room and took me up the gym and who's sitting there on, on a bike just cycling away himself it's, it's Roy and you know just meeting the guy is, is something else but knowing that you're going to have to train with him and play with him is, is and something and smash else. him did you smash and, him and smash I, I don't mean to smash him but that's I, I mean slip him slip him in training and, and apologising just wasn't enough for Roy. He just kept his kept himself quiet, waited five minutes, and then almost half main two, <laughs> where he came charging in and picked himself up and just walked away. That's 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 Roy. Did I make that mistake again? I don't know. No, I, I try to stay away from him and training, but uh, no, that was funny. I mean, I, I charged and tried to win the ball, and you're like, you lose your feet, and, and everything went silent. And I said, "Oh, sorry," I didn't even look at me. And then, as I say, a couple of minutes later, ball comes to me. I take the touch at my feet. He comes in. You can see a mile away happening. And uh, scissor right around the hips. And everybody, you know, burst out laughing after it when we, we got to uh, the dressing room, seeing I bottled it for Roy Keane. I'm thinking, I'd like to see one of you stand up to him. But that's the kind of character he was. He was, he was intimidating. As soon as you went on the training pitch, really intimidating. Unbelievable player, but really... The, stand, uh, the standards he, he held, you could see why why he controlled that Manchester United team through all their success. And I think when he came to Celtic, and he's playing with guys like myself who've just came through Dundee United, I think he thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> I need to call this a day in a few months. But it was a great privilege to play with him. But you mentioned some other top ones there. Uh, walking in, Neil Lennon, who'd been there through all the success. Um, Alan Thompson. You know, he was another favourite of mine at Celtic and I played against him numerous times. Uh, the service he gave the club and the goals he scored. Petrov, again, what a player. Okay. 
and Big Bobo, guys like that who just held such sway with the Celtic fans and you're walking in there, one day you're training with Dundee United players who are all good players, but the next day you're at Barrafield training with these superstars. It's something else. How long does it take to feel comfortable, like you say, amongst those superstars? Obviously then it does, the, the, the Seville team, they gradually fade out um, and Strachan builds his own side. But how long do you feel like, oh, right, I'm, I'm meant to be here now? It did take me a wee while. Um, never really felt part of it. I mean, it took me a few weeks. Gordon told me I wasn't going to play in the team. He pulled me at the Hilton Hotel at pre uh, pre-match, like before the Motherwell game or something. I was only there a couple of weeks and he, he says, like, you're going to need to bide your time here, which was fine. I, I thought that was the case anyway. I had no problem with that. Um, and again, because Paul Telford, I think, or, oh no, sorry, Mo Kamara, it just wasn't performing well enough and Gordon put me at left back and I managed to stay in the team right in that run, um, played at Ibrox, beat Rangers and, and kind of made the left back position moan at that period. And then once we, we clinched the league, um you know, there's I've I've got a great picture somewhere when we clinched the league against Harps at Celtic Park we won one nil. Um Lenny grabs me with Stan um Stan Petrov and we're doing a mini huddle the three is in the middle of the pitch and um you know that meant a lot to me because it was kinda them recognising that I'd played some part, you know, they, they were they were still ahead in the league by when I got there in January. But you know, sometimes January to me is some of the hardest hardest games you need to negotiate. So that was pleasing. It wasn't probably to the following uh, season when we were actually into the league season. I'd done the full pre season. I'd went away to I think we went away to America. Um. I felt comfortable. New signings coming in, so I wasn't the new boy anymore. There was other new guys in the dressing room that I could act like I'd been there for years. Uh, and that just made you feel a wee bit more comfortable. And then, you know, further down the line, once you get into the Champions League games and you find yourself in the starting lineup, that's when I really started to feel a part of it. Those Champions League nights, obviously, well, we've been the fans, we've been in the stands. What's it like being there on the pitch, walking out? Uh, it's it's hard to it's hard to describe because it's it's a, it's probably the highlight uh, of my career um, because I, I've said numerous times growing up watching the Champions League from the early format when you know when it changed when Rangers were in it uh, you know games against Leeds and you had Marcy when it, I remember all that you know and then when the groups rejigged and. You had the great Man United teams that I followed constantly. I loved watching it on ITV. It was only one channel, remember, that showed it back then. And uh, they're, they're run to the final 99. So the Champions League was the pinnacle for me. To, to get to that stage was my dream. And um, I was lucky that I went to Celtic and instantly kind of achieved it. There was... was you know, there wasn't any struggle to get there like there is nowadays. Celtic have to play this nonsense a three qualifiers, a four qualifier and a playoff. There was none of that. We went straight in and it was just amazing. Walking out at Old Trafford, uh, I said Man United were my team in England that I followed in the Champions League. Walking out at Old Trafford and, uh, and standing there and hearing the song coming on, it was unbelievable. It's a moment I'll never forget. And then followed it up by playing you know, in some big, big matches, especially at Celtic Park. Walking out for the first one, um, Celtic Park and, and seeing the atmosphere, it was incredible. And then to, to further that and, and playing the last 16, I mean, I remember walking out against AC Milan um, in the last 16 of the Champions League at Celtic Park. You're looking across and they've got guys that you've grown up as a kid watching. You're thinking, I'm playing against these guys. But the atmosphere around Celtic Park was just something that... that uh, I'd never experienced. Try to think. I don't think I'd ever been to a Champions League game actually at Celtic Park. Um, prior to that, I always just watched it on the TV because I was yeah. playing for Dundee United at that time. So I think that might have been my first one, but it was you know what something. What an introduction, else. eh? Yeah, it was. It was not bad. You could think of worse ones. Man United, were you up against Ronaldo? Uh, I um, I, so we played against Ronaldo a couple of times. Um, three maybe. Three, three or four times. Um, so then they are in the first game. I think they were, I was up against Giggs on one yeah. side. That, that Man United team at that time. I think they were everywhere. I mean, Giggs 
schools. I think Darren Fletcher played in the Midland Park and Ronaldo was the other side. So, I mean, it's not like the Man United team you see now who chop and change. You pretty much knew who you're playing against. Played against Ronaldo. Roy Keane's testimonial. Played against him again. Um, played against him uh, 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 here at Celtic Park where we drew um, one each. If you remember, I think Giggs scores in near enough the last few minutes where Scotty McDonald gives us the lead. Um, so played against him a few times. Had interesting battles. I would say he's just edged me in the career stats right enough. Just so his a little bit. Took a different trajectory from mine's. Just a tiny bit. Just a tiny bit. <laughs> um, I was speaking about that. Obviously, Champions League is your peak. What, what was it like working under Gordon Strachan? How good a manager was he? Amazing. Honestly, amazing. And I, I, I understand that there is a divide with Celtic fans who, who just couldn't take him for some reason who didn't like either his style of management or how he came across in the press. But for the players, well, and me, me in particular, I, I loved it. Um, I was told when I went in, uh, my agent at that time was Darren Jackson, and Darren had worked under Gordon at Coventry. So when he took me to Celtic, he says the one thing about him, he's honest, he's, he's harsh sometimes, but his standards are so high and you will love his training. Now, I think that's important to players to, to go in each day looking forward to training and going away for training, knowing that they've absolutely knocked their pan in. They're knackered, you know, and they go home and they rest and you come back the next day, want to do it all again. And Gordon's training was like that. And how he managed how he managed the squad was impressive. Having my wee stint in management um, and, and having different characters in the dressing room, um, looking back to how Gordon managed different characters, different age groups was, uh, again, remarkable how how he, he went about his business. Tactically, brilliant. Um, I think you can now see that in hindsight with some of the results he got against some huge teams at Celtic Park and and some of the results we're seeing now at Celtic Park in Champions League qualifiers and Europa League. I just done not happen back in Gordon's day. And I would argue that the team we had in that day I don't think was much better than the team just now. Uh, I think they're pretty even in terms of Scottish contingent and, you know, a few foreigners here and there. But um, it was just a, a, an outstanding bond we had in that team and Gordon got the best out of everybody uh, in the squad. The thing was, you, you didn't want to disappoint him. That, that was the thing. You had a fear factor because, uh, as you can imagine, he could get quite angry of you... Uh, if you upset him, um, but it was a, a privilege and he was the best manager I played under. It comes to an end, obviously, um, for Strachan. And I think it's a title for Tommy. There's there's guys like Aidan McGeady and Darren Adi, but you've grew up a Celtic fan. How how tough was it being at the club at that period of Tommy Burns' death? It was, I because, um, you know, Tommy was being a Celtic fan, obviously, for life and, and, and knowing what Tommy was to the club was... It was an incredibly difficult time. Aidan and Darren had Tommy around their careers like a father figure. They knew him personally and had a great relationship with him. And it hit them really hard. And, you know, you could see that the squad came around him at that time. Um, for myself, I was much like the fans who, who who didn't know him really before I got to Celtic. Came across him a few times Um and Scotland gatherings and, and under 21 setups and things and Tommy was about and I just loved the guy right away and I, I've got photos of me and Tommy at Strathclyde Park in the, uh, from way back in the 90s when he was manager and things as a kid um, so instantly connected with him when I went there but um, when he went it was just you know it was kind of surreal because he was it was such a part of the club um, seeing him every day and uh, you know, that's what got me because we seen him every day and they brightened up the dressing room every single morning. He was in with, with some line that would just pick up the place, no matter how tired you were. You, you know what it's like, you come at your work sometimes, you're grumpy and you're sitting there with the head down and you're maybe, or somebody's reading a paper and he would just come in at the blue with some one-liner and you'd be laughing. Um, and then we gradually seen less and less of him without really understanding what the full extent was, uh, if that makes sense. It just kind of drifted away gradually. And before we knew it, he was ill and the news came through that he was really ill. So it was a really difficult time to be at. And 
obviously when he passed, the one one thing that sticks in my head was Gordon uh, striking, pulling the squad together at Lennox Town. I think it might have been the day after he died um, and pulled everybody on, on the pitch just as you go out. You'll see the media gathering at it just now for picture uh, and things of the players training. And we all gathered around the full squad, everybody's staff, and he, he had, you know, he had a great speech, told everybody then, five, ten minutes, go and have a walk. And the squad dispersed over the pitches at Lennox Town, went a wee walk. Obviously, certain individuals were more upset than, than others. A couple of the foreigners who loved him maybe didn't understand what he, he meant um, in, the, in the whole picture of the club. And we came back together and got together and, and won that league. And it was it was a, it was a bittersweet um, moment, but... Tommy, I think, will, will live in everybody's hearts forever. I've never, I've never came across a guy who is so popular ever. Though no. when you speak to everybody, and I often wonder how is that possible? How can you be liked by everybody? But by everybody, he, uh, he was. One guy who wasn't was Tony Mowbray. What went wrong there? <laughs> <laughs> what a segue! Well, what, well, <laughs> what went? Um, obviously, you were part of that that Saint Mirren defeat as well, the Mowbray moment. Uh, what just went wrong that whole season? Did, did did you did you see that coming, or did you quite like Mowbray when he came in, or what was the vibe? Um, no, I didn't see it coming. Not right at the start. I, I was I was devastated uh, personally that Gordon had had left. Um, and when Tony came in, actually, a, a part of me was excited because I'd seen his hub sides before and years gone by. Played a track and football. Everybody had good things to say about him, and. He came in uh, with Peter Grant, um, who, again, I kind of knew. Um, and I thought, yeah, this will be good for me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, so much of the time I was injured when he first came in. I think I was recovering from an operation in the summer. So he comes in and that kind of put me in the back foot right away. I don't think he really, I didn't really, well, when I say I didn't really, I didn't have any communication with him. He didn't, um, didn't really speak to me, if, if I'm honest, when he came in. Uh, pre-season at Lennox Town with his team uh, or who he thought was the fit players he worked on didn't really interact with me who I was working with the physios at the time and I, I just kind of instantly felt out it a bit um, but anyway I worked my way back to fitness got myself back in into training and you know I managed to find myself back in the team but I was uh, I was disjointed to say the least if I'm being totally honest and I think if you ask any any of the players around about that period, they would say the same. I, I think Tony's a, a lovely guy. I, I really do. I, I know he's been successful at uh, other clubs. Uh, it just didn't work at Celtic. I think there was too many different voices, uh, if I'm honest. I thought training was... Uh, training wasn't bad. It was just it was complicated at times. And we'd went through Gordon Strachan's training, who... Who then brought in Neil Lennon um, and the coaching staff? That was fiery. It was tempo was so high. As I say, everybody knocked her pan in. You walked off the the pitch and you thought I've put in a real shift there. It was kind of the opposite under uh, under Tony. It was a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of drills you would do, and you'd stop and you scratch your head and go, "Am I supposed to run there? Am I? Are you supposed to do it?" And you know, it wasn't just me. It was there was other players like that as well. Um, and at that time, I think he, he came in and he tried to change a lot of what Gordon uh, had brought in. So guys like Gary Caldwell and, and Steve McManus and I'm not sure, did Scotty McDonald go at that time? And Barry Robson, things like that. Guys who had been, you know, pretty influential over the, the last couple of years and, and were big in the dressing room. Slowly got phased out and uh, replaced with guys who who were there just for the short term, let's say that. I think there was a lot of guys who came in just thinking, oh, we'll go to Celtic, we'll win we'll win 4-0 every week, I'll score a couple and I'll get a move to back down south. And you know yourself, that, that just doesn't work. You, you see right through that and the cracks slowly begin to appear and that's what happened that season. That is what happened. And then obviously it's no surprise that you, you've already said that Lennon obviously comes back and you play some of your best football under him because it's sort of he's, he's emulating what 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 Strachan brought around. Well, that was the thing. As soon as, as soon as Neil came back and as the interim manager at that point, the training just reverted back to to what it was under Gordon Strachan. 
Uh, and it does sound like I'm being unfair on Tony. Tony has his way of working and it's worked at certain places. It just didn't work at Celtic. But uh, Lenny came in and training was fantastic again. You know, high tempo stuff, uh, 4v4 games, you know, things that you had to take real responsibility. And, you know, 4v4 games and training might sound simple, but there's a real responsibility there to not drop your man. It's high intensity. There is no hiding place. And that's the way training was. It was um, you know, the, the tactics and stuff we worked on were direct. He knew how to win games in this league and he got a reaction for the team. He went on a, a great run, um, albeit the, the Ross County <laughs> semi-final wasn't a great, but apart from that in the league, he, he went on a great run and he deservedly got the job and things looked or seemed a lot brighter at that point and I, I just see like it was back to what it was for the previous three or four years under Gordon Stratton. I can't not mention it because it's one of it genuinely is one of my first footballing memories and I remember that night that Rangers goal I was jumping up and down the living room and I'm not ashamed to say it but <laughs> talk about it talk me through it I taught you through it well I, god I was surprised as anybody let's start with that um it was it was a funny time in my Celtic career because a, a couple of weeks before it, I'd went uh up to Aberdeen and uh I'd scored Played centre half that night. I scored a header. That was my first Celtic goal. I think we went to Tanadice and I, I kind of scored a deflected goal there as well. You were on a spree. I was on a spree of two goals at that point. So I thought, uh, listen, I fancy myself here to score again. But uh, I mean, the number of people that have said to me that they had me as first goal scorer that night is, is in, I mean, I, I thought there must be absolutely nuts to put me on. But anyway, I, I made a few people a few quid. But well, it was the game was mad that night. It, it was just a, a different level. I think there's always something uh, a, a bit crazy about uh, a Celtic Rangers game under the floodlights. And yeah. we'd, we'd, God, at that stage, we'd played something like five times that season. Uh, drew 2-2 two, two, and they got a man sent off. And, you know, the way Neil played at that time... Two fullbacks push on, and I loved that. And Ben and Kaya, or whoever it was in midfield, would sit in for us. And I remember the ball just falling to me and thought, why not? And I connected with the first volley brilliantly. Papatch. And I wish to this day it went in. I really did. But Sasa Papatch got in the line, got his head in front of it. And the second volley wasn't quite as sweet, but sometimes you need that wee bit of luck. Scarfed it into the ground and over McGregor. And geez, what a feeling. Um, to be honest, didn't know where to run, didn't really know what to do. Um, but I always remember I ran to the kind of halfway line where I used to sit and I wondered if my pal still had the season ticket up there. I don't know if he, I don't know if he still, still did or know. lost touch with him a, a few years ago, but it was uh, it was a great moment and one that you know, fortunate enough that people still speak about it just now, still stop me and ask me about it, and it'll be something I've got forever, I suppose. Absolutely. Obviously, the league then, it didn't quite work out um, that season. Next again season, Lennon starts to build his own side. You're, you're looking at the, looks at the likes of Adam Matthews and Mika Lustig. Was there always sort of that idea? That, were you, obviously, your injuries as well, were you more than aware that things were coming to an end? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, look, I, I knew I was I was on borrowed time pretty much. Um, like pretty much my full career, if I'm honest. I was told, you know, when I was 17 that I would probably be lucky to I was getting to 30. And like that that was true all the way through the amount of operations I had, and it was always stop start for me. I wasn't through lack of trying or anything. But at that time, um Neil was wanting to play a certain style of football, quick attacking fullbacks. I'd obviously every operation you go in for, you lose a bit of your pace. I was well aware of that, and I was becoming less and less mobile. And I knew that, I was honest enough when I, uh, and when you're bringing in, look, you didn't bring in rubbish, that's the thing. In my time at Celtic, I had to contend with, you know, you had Paul Telfer, hugely experienced, Andy Hinkle, who who played for Germany, uh, you know, then you went Chad Uri, who's got about three million caps for South Korea, you've got, okay. uh, you've got Lustig, you've got Matthews, who was playing for Wales at the time, Lustig, a hugely experienced Swedish internationalist, and I had all but half a cap for Scotland, so it was always challenging. Um, but I managed to hang about. But at that time, at that time, I, I just knew that it was it was winding down, and you know, it didn't make it any easier when Neil told me that 
they, they weren't renewing my contract and I said, OK, that's fine. Thanks very much. And I would love to stay. But I mean, like, everything comes to an end, doesn't it? And I needed to take it on the chin. So you played your part in that nine in a row, not ten in a row, that nine in a row <laughs> run. Um, and then obviously we've touched on it. You go down south to Bristol City. It doesn't quite work out under McInnes. And you come back up to Dundee United. And you said earlier, obviously, you do think that they're, they're the biggest club in Dundee. Obviously, Celtic are your club, but what sort of affinity do you hold with Dundee United? I, I love them. I, I honestly love them. And uh, I don't think a lot of players who come through at a certain club would, would say that, but United treated me so well uh, first time round. The guys uh, at the club at that time, the history of the club was something that stuck with me. Now, by the time I got back second time round, it was a different club, um, a different structure, trained in a different place. They've got a great setup at St Andrews. Uh, uni and even the owners had changed Stephen Thompson was in uh, who had taken over from his dad to I dealt with uh, Eddie Thompson who was a great guy Stephen's slightly different and different coaching team so totally different but you still you still have the affinity of the club um, my dad's from Dundee um, he was a Celtic fan but all his family are Dundee United fans so <laughs> it was weird how it was all connected but I loved it and I was lucky enough that I played in a Dundee United side that were exciting and refreshing for me to go in at, you know, late twenties, uh, and and play with some of these young guys who who went on to sign for Celtic, a, a couple of them, uh, and get to another cup final. It was brilliant. I was just going to touch upon like say um, Andy Robertson, Stuart Armstrong. Now these are the guys that are that playing such an integral part in, in Scotland, obviously getting to the Euros. We'll, we'll touch that in a minute, but did you always see that from a young age in the likes of Armstrong and Robertson? Ryan Gold? Uh, I, well, the Gold Gold was a standout one. I, I thought Gold was one of the the best young players I've seen. And he's making he's making quite a comeback just now if you if you track his progress, yeah. having to maybe take a step back to go a couple forward. Um Armstrong was Stuart Armstrong was an outstanding young player. He had great power and pace. And I did think he could step up to the next level. Um, I didn't know if it would be Celtic level or how he would how he would uh, cope with that environment. But very clever guy, Stuart as well. You know, studies. I wonder if he's got his law degree. He was studying law at the time. I think he has. I remember that at Celtic. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, and then Who's Andy. The ah, I, I mean Andy Robertson was. <laughs> to see if I'm honest, when I get signed by Jackie. Andy had just signed a few weeks or maybe a month previous from Queen's Park and he was left back and I thought he's a young kid. Maybe they'll give him a few games and I'll, I'll play left back and it's maybe bed him in. Uh, and then I seen him in training and seen him in the first few games and he just went, he just went that way. Every game he played, he improved. Uh, it was uh, it was weird to see because usually you see players, young players take a dip. He just got better and better and better. Nobody in the league could get by him. And that's the most important thing uh, as a fullback. And I think he showed that then when he went to Hull and Liverpool. He's, he's renowned for his attacking ability, but defensively, he's 1v1. He's he's right up there. Nobody gets by him. So I was lucky enough to to be involved with, with the boys. And I'm I'm delighted that they went and, you know, furthered career with a bigger club, Gary McKay Stephen as well. I thought Absolutely. he was... He was an exceptional talent, you know, tricks and flicks and training, but had an end product. And, you know, they served the club well when they went to Celtic, especially Stuart Armstrong. Um, served the club very well. Now, of course, the one that didn't he was Nadir Sifsi, and I thought he would. I thought he would be. Really? The, well, on Clyde Super Scoreboard, when he went, I thought, he's the kind of maverick that, that will do well for Celtic. He took the number seven jersey, and... Uh, That's the first big mistake. Ah, uh, that's enough. I've lived to regret that statement, so I hope Certainly he's doing all right for Celtic. <laughs> Obviously, like you see, the knees, they brought uh, an end to your career, probably a little bit more prematurely than with, with all of light. Was the transition into management, was it always something you were wanting to do? Was it always in, in the pipeline? Um, and Not always, but the tail end of my career, when I knew, listen, when I knew I, I was going into training and hobbling and things, I thought, right, okay, better do something about this and it was when I came back up the road from Bristol to Dundee United r roughly around about then when I, I moved back to Glasgow 
a coaching course came up. The B license was at Broadwood Stadium, Clyde, and I got, I think, the last place. I think it was fully booked, and I phoned up and says, look, can I go on this? I think it was Donald Park at the time. He says, look, we'll squeeze you in, come along. Did it over a couple of months, and then I kind of caught the bug um, from that, um, done the A license. And then at that time, Paul Hartley, I was playing at Dundee United, Paul Hartley, who had been with at Celtic, who had a, a great relationship with at Celtic, was our manager. And and through a chief scout at Dundee United, Graham Livingston, who was at Awa also, he said, would you like to come and do a bit of coaching for us voluntarily? And I said, uh, of course. So I took the reserve team under Paul and had a couple of great years there. Gave me a great ground and, and it gave me the experience I needed. And uh, I, I kind of followed on from there and I enjoy it. I, I do enjoy it. It's a bug. You know, it's, it's great being involved. It's the closest you get to... To playing, you know, punditry and, and giving comments and games is, is brilliant. I do love it. I, I love doing the podcast, but nothing beats actually being in the restroom and being involved in a match day on a Saturday. And I think any ex pro who's played will tell you that. Right, role comes and you back there then? I hope so. I hope so. But I'll need to work in my CV, I think, because we even. Leaving breaking Club 42 and League 2. Well, exactly, <laughs> Club 42. Aye, ah, yeah, it's Aye. a pain to that I've beaten, but uh, I, was, like, uh, I love my time at Airdrie and I thought I was, uh, I, I did what I was asked at Airdrie. Um, just I left because of circumstances at the club, whether it was the right decision or not, I don't know. But breaking, slightly different. Club's in a, a hard place and we just found it impossible. We tried a million things to, to get results and different players and... Pfft, just didn't happen. And that's why, look, I sympathise with, with Neil Lennon. I'm one of the guys who, who sit on a podcast and, and say, is it right he's still the manager? He, probably he should have went in December. Um, and I know how hard that is to hear, albeit on a minuscule basis compared to Neil Lennon. But um, it, wouldn't they, it wouldn't they put me off getting back in, that's for sure. Mark, I could sit and talk to you for hours. I really could, um, ah, but I am conscious of time. I just one final question for you. Um, this show is called Soccer Supernova, so one final question: If you could have a glass of champagne with anyone when this pandemic's over, with who are you sitting down with? Oh, geez. Well, Supernova, actually, William Gallagher. There you go. The name, I good the stuff. Name's in the, the title, I, I would love that, but. Can't see it happening anytime soon. Don't think Wayne would be up for it. You and me both, the three of us. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And thank you once again for joining me on Soccer Supernova.